last Sunday of the year, 2021. Um, first of all, I want to thank God uh, for helping and guiding us throughout this year uh, and for getting us to this point again in our lives and in the life of this church, uh, despite another year of this pandemic. Uh, I don't know about you, but I just said, this is what I said on Christmas Eve. I'm getting tired of this. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't know. This is never going to be normal uh, for me, although, uh, you know, you get used to it. Uh, it's still not normal. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not normal like this. Uh, you know, yeah, I expect people to be here, but uh, because of the pandemic, you know, a lot of people are in their homes, afraid of this Omicron or whatever, and um, it's just not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, and so, as we start uh, a new year, uh, my hope and my prayer is that we start things off on the right foot or on the right track. That's why next Sunday, just like what I announced earlier, uh, the first Sunday of 2022, we will begin by having a prayer Sunday. Uh, it'll be led by our deacons and our our elders. Um, why? Uh, well, you know that prayer is the breath and life of a believer. Uh, we all know this. Uh, and beginning uh, the new year with prayer is like beginning our days with prayer. Uh, most of us do that. Uh, I don't know who does that. Some, some they end their day with prayer. Some they begin their days with prayer. Um, but beginning your day with prayer, um, I think, uh, puts us in a state of surrender when it comes to whatever God has in store for us that day. Um, and that's what prayer does. Uh, it aligns our will towards God's will. Um, yes, we do ask God for things. Uh, don't get me wrong. You don't, just, you don't just say, God, align my will with yours. That's not how we pray. We ask God for things. But in faith, whatever God does, gives us that day, whether he gives us the thing that you ask for or withholds for us the thing that we ask for, the point of prayer is that we believe that whatever happens, uh, God intends it for our good. Uh, and we surrender to that. And that's what prayer does. Um, prayer is not like you rubbing a lamp and the genie comes out and you just ask whatever you want, the genie gives it to you. That's not prayer, <laughs> okay? The purpose of prayer is for us to align ourselves with the will of God, to, to fully surrender to what God has in store for us uh, as individuals and as a church, uh, that we will trust that whatever answers he has to our prayers, he has the best uh, of all of us and as a church in mind. Uh, that's what we trust. That's what we believe our God is, that he is good. Uh, that whatever is good for us, that's what he's going to give us. Right? Um, so that's what's going to happen uh, on uh, next Sunday. Okay, we'll start off with prayer, aligning ourselves with God's will for us as individuals and uh, us as a church. But before we get there, uh, this morning, I would like for us to end the year uh, by focusing on the topic of rest. Okay? Uh, this came up during one of our prayer meetings uh, when we were talking about the rhythm uh, and blues of life. That life has a rhythm. Life is not all about just work. And life is not all about just rest. Those of you in prayer meeting, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I think it was Paul that says, why don't you do that on uh, the last Sunday? Uh, and here we are. <laughs> we're doing it on the last Sunday. Uh, so we're going to talk about rest. Uh, so by, by way of raising your hands, who here needs some rest? <laughs> I know, eh? Uh, who here is tired of resting? <laughs> I know some people, you know, I slept all week. Uh, there's nothing to do because of this lockdown. I slept the whole weekend. I'm tired of resting. That's why I'm here. Uh, but we do. Uh, as human beings, uh, we are uh, designed by God to need rest. Uh, so the reason why we're taking up this topic of rest is because uh, even if we begin the year with prayer, okay, but don't know what it means to rest in God, it makes the practice of prayer futile. Do you, you believe that? If you don't know how to rest in God, if you don't know what it means to rest in God, but you pray, what for? 
if you're not going to rest in God anyway, why pray? Uh, that's why this topic is kind of, uh, you know, goes well with our topic next Sunday. If you can't rest in God, then it makes the practice of prayer futile. Because when we pray, again, we place ourselves in the position of submission. We trust that God will always do what's best for us, whether he answers our prayers or by giving us what we pray for or withholding from us what we pray for. So when we pray, we're actually praying in faith. Not for God to be our genie and grant us our wishes, but for God's will to be done in our lives, even if it doesn't align with what we want. And that takes a lot of faith, and that's what it means to submit to the will of God, by faith through prayer. Uh, and for that to happen to each of us, to be willingly submitted to that, we need to learn what it means to rest in God. Need to learn what it means to rest in God. And for us to learn that, first of all, let's define what rest means. There's a lot of definition for rest. Like if I say, the rest of you, does that mean the same as take a rest, take a break? It doesn't. There's a lot of definitions for rest, but we're going to focus on a couple. Uh, rest is a freedom from work, freedom from toil, a freedom from strain or activity. That's rest. When you're, like those of you who usually work Sundays, you're at rest right now. Right? No, you're not working. <laughs> That's what it means. You stop working. You're not active. You're resting. Rest is also the cessation or the stop of motion. Stop of motion or action of any kind and applicable to any body or being, as in rest from labor, uh, or applicable also to our mental state, as in rest from mental exertion. When, you, you, when you're always thinking, you're always worrying, your mind is not at rest. Your mind is always you know, moving and in action and motion. Therefore, a body is at rest when it ceases to move. That's why when somebody passes away, somebody dies, what do you say? Rest in that's it. When you're dead, that's it. Now, there are some dead bodies that still move. That's, that's something else. It's called, <laughs> those of you who, who know the nurses, you know what it's called. Uh, when, when the body moves, what, when it's dead. What is it called? I forget the term. But I've heard stories of dead bodies moving. So, so no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. That's just science. That's just biology. But I'm talking about when, when a body is at rest, that's when it stops to move. When the mind is at rest, that's when it stops to be disturbed or agitated. Um, and the opposite of being at rest is like looking at the sea. Like when you look at the sea, it's never just flat. The sea is always moving. It's never just calm. It's, like, it's not like a lake. Um, there are days when you wake up in the morning when I go camping, I see the lake. It's flat. It's like a, a big mirror. The sea is never like that. It always keeps on moving. That's what it means to not be at rest. Right? Now, God designed us as human beings to need rest in order to function properly. Uh, some of us, if we don't get enough sleep, the next day we're all grumpy. Uh, can't concentrate, can't think. Why? Because God didn't design you to keep going. Uh, you're not the energizer uh, bunny. Right? You need some rest physically mentally. Without rest, human beings tend to get, what, burnt out. Physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. We all need rest. Right? The question now is, what does it mean for us to rest? Well, based on the definition, just stop moving. Stop thinking. Right? Stop working, whatever. But just stop doing what you're doing. That's what, based on the definition, tells us how to rest. Uh, and physically and mentally, it's true. Uh, but if we dig deeper, we will find that being at rest, at its core or at its root, is not all about stopping. Okay? And I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, the reason I say that, the reason we're able to rest and to stop and just to be idle 
is the fact that at the root or at the essence of rest is about having faith and continuing to have faith. Okay? And some of you what do you mean? At the root of the essence of rest is about having faith and continuing to have faith. That's why I said earlier that rest is not about, it's not all about stopping because you're still pretty much doing something so that you could rest. And what is that that you do? You have faith. Um, now, what do I mean by that? Uh, for example, I'll give it to you for you. Um, it's an illustration. Uh, when Eli, my eldest son, first started to drive, I had a hard time sleeping when he was in, at the wheel. I don't know if you have this experience. You haven't, you're not driving it, are you? Roy? No? Okay. I'm telling you, once you start driving, quicker roll me, he's not going to sit there and be asleep. Uh, when Eli first started to drive, I was sitting in the back seat. Never, I can never fall asleep. I'm always awake. I can't rest. Why? So I don't trust his driving skills. <laughs> he's new and he's young. So I don't know, I don't know what this guy's going to do. Maybe, maybe he goes crazy and goes, you know, 150 over the speed limit. I don't know, right? Or maybe he tails soak too close. And he breaks, all, you know, suddenly. Um, so I don't trust his driving skills. That's why I couldn't rest. Um, so um, because I was fully confident in him as a driver, um, there was no rest for me when I'm in the car with him. But as time goes by, and as he has proven his driving skills to be good and, and safe, uh, now when he's at the wheel, I can sleep. Okay. I can't say the same for Ati Jan, for my wife. But, <laughs> but for Eli, um, I'm good. I can sleep whenever he's driving. So what happened there? Uh, for me to be at rest and to be able to sleep while Eli is driving meant that I would have to stop doubting the driving skills of my son. Um, and for that to happen, I would need to trust that Eli would not drive us into a wall or continue to drive even though there's traffic. Right? Um, and for me to continue to sleep on an hour drive, I need to keep trusting in that, even in my sleep. Um, for a lot of us, uh, the reason why we can't fully rest is because we don't fully trust. Okay? Okay? But but langit tamay wag magagalit. The reason we can't fully rest is because we don't fully trust. The reason for our anxiety, the reason why we can't stop working, or why we can't stop moving, why we can't sleep at night, is because we don't trust anyone or anything but ourselves to get the job done, whatever that job is. Okay. I'm not gonna give, give you any examples. You apply it to your own situation. Whatever it is that you're trying to do that you can't just you can't stop doing and take a, a break, take a rest, the reason why you're like that is because you can't fully trust. Um, now, this kind of mindset or this attitude is very dangerous, not just to the way we live our lives here on earth, because I remember I said earlier, if you keep going that way, you're going to burn yourself out. You're going to die early. <laughs> I have a friend who has like five jobs. And we told her, you can't keep doing that. Because if you do, yo, yo, we'll, let's start planning for your funeral right now. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work that way. We're not designed as people to, be, to live a life like that here on earth. So it has an effect on the way we live on earth. And it can also have an effect on the way we spend time in eternity. If we don't know how to rest, and rest in God, namely... It can have an effect on how we spend time in eternity. I'm going to show you this truth, hopefully, through our text in Hebrews 4. Let's, let's read our text again, Hebrews 4.1. Can you guys read it? I want you guys to read it. Sometimes when I read it, you don't really understand what I'm reading. If you read it, it's different. So can you guys read it? At home, read it as well. Okay. Therefore, on the promise of entering his rest, still there, still being offered, 
Let us fear lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach it. Now, first rule of Bible reading is what? When you see the therefore, what do you do? You go back, right? Why, why? What, what's, what's he concluding here? What's the therefore for? You go back to the verse that it's referring to. In this case, it's referring to the previous verse in chapter 3. Uh, chapter 3, verse 19. Can you guys read that? Because of unbelief. So what does the author say here, the author of Hebrews? He's saying that those people who weren't able to enter, who are those people? Those people who wandered in the wilderness after escaping from Egypt. It is those people who rebelled and provoked God for 40 years. Those people who ended up dying in the wilderness. And those of whom who swore, or God swore, will not enter his rest. Those people did not enter God's rest because of their unbelief. Uh, now what is this referring to? This is referring to, obviously, uh, the continuation of our main preaching series in Exodus, uh, which, by the way, we will resume in a couple of weeks. Um, so after traveling in the wilderness in Exodus, we're not there yet, right? We're still in Egypt in Exodus. But uh, once they got out and they traveled the wilderness for 40 years and they got to the borders of the promised land, what did uh, God do? God said to Moses, go send out some spies. Remember this from one of Kuei Eugene's uh, sermons. They sent out some spies to go check out what the promised land is like, right? Who they send out? Ten, ten spies. A couple of those are Joshua and Caleb, right? So they send out the spies. After 40 days of spying out the land, the spies returned, saying that, the, the, yo, this land is filled with, or flowing with, milk and Honey, the grapes are so big that two people have to carry them. But <laughs> the cities are, or the inhabitants uh, of, the, of, these, of this land is also very big. They are so big, they make us look like grasshoppers. You guys remember this from Queen Eugene's uh, sermon? Right? So yeah, milk and honey everywhere. But also giants everywhere. So believing this report for, from some of the spies, the people of Israel, what did they do? Did they say, it doesn't matter, let's go, let's take the land. No, that's not what they said. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. What did they say? They said this, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? For by the sword, our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? <laughs> this is after going through the wilderness for how many years? They finally get to the borders. They send out spies. Spies came back. It is what God has promised. But there are some giants there that we have to overcome. These people say, all right, let's go back. <laughs> Forget this. I didn't go all this way just to be trampled like a grasshopper. And so what did the Caleb and Joshua do? They tried to calm the people down. No, 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 no. We can do this. We have God with us. We can do this. God promised us this land. This is our land. We just need to take it by faith. Right? But did they stop the rebellion? No. Why? Because the congregation, the Israelites, did not believe. It's impossible for us to take this land because of who's in it. And this kindled the anger of the Lord. And then the Lord declared judgment on these people. What did God say to these people? As I live, God says, or declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead body shall fall in the wilderness, and of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. <laughs> Nobody over 20 <laughs> is going to enter this land because they 
grumbled against God. And that grumbling came from an attitude or a mindset of unbelief. Why? Because they don't know how to rest in God. So these are the people that the author of Hebrews is warning us about. Right? Saying at the end of chapter 3 that these people were unable to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. This is why I said that this kind of thinking is very dangerous. A mindset that does not know how to rest and therefore lacks faith is very dangerous. Not just physically, but more so spiritually. Uh, number one cause of heart failure is anxiety, depression. Right? Why? Because people don't know how to rest. People just can't let go of things and just trust in God. A lot of us have a hard time doing that. Especially when the th th things get rough, right? When things are good, it's easy. But when things are bad, it's hard. We all lack faith. And, and it's very dangerous to have this kind of mentality. That's why when you look at the first verse of chapter 4, it parallels the last verse, verse of chapter 2. Look at uh, four one again. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have failed to reach it. Chapter 4, 1 says the promise of entering his rest still stands. What, what, why, why do I uh, circle that? Why do I ask you guys to notice that? Because that rest parallels the promised land in chapter 3, verse 19. Entering the promised land and entering God's rest, is a, it parallels. There's a significance to it, right? The rest parallels the promised land because that's the place where the grumbling Israelites were unable to enter, right? They weren't able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. Now, have that in, having that in mind, if we were to paraphrase the conclusion of chapter uh, 4, verse 1, it says, therefore, while the promise of entering the promised land or God's rest still stands or still available, the conclusion says that those who fail to reach it should fear, right? I'm just paraphrasing what it says in the verse. If you fail to reach that, the rest, you should fear, right? Or in other words, since the grumbling Israelites were not able to enter the promised land because of their lack of faith, those of us who the author of Hebrews are talking to should fear not to believe in the promise of entering God's rest that is being offered to you even today. Do you get what I'm saying? You should fear not believing in the promise of God's rest that is being offered to us even today. Today. Right? Or let me say it another way. Fear the unbelief that those grumbling Israelites had. Because that is what will keep you from entering the promised land or God's rest. Is that better? Clearer? Let me say in Tagalog. Matakot kayo na wag maniwala. Saan? Sa pangako na makapasok kayo sa sa langit or sa rest ng Panginoon. Ang katakutan nyo is huwag maniwala. Clear? Fear unbelief. Fear that you won't believe. It's a very important point. Because what Piper said, and I quote, fear unbelief, fear not trusting God. Why? Because that's the reason why the Hebrew Israelites weren't able to enter the promised land. That's why if you look at verse 11, chapter 4, look what it says. You guys read it. Okay. 
he repeated pretty much verse 1. Right? Therefore, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall. No one may be restricted or unable to enter God's rest because of the same sort of disobedience. Now the striving in here is not a striving as in work. Don't work for it. The striving here is a striving to depend and to trust God to overcome our unbelief so that we can enter his rest and not fall into disobedience. Clear? The striving is not working to please God so that we can enter. The striving is a fight of faith. Have you heard that somewhere? Fight the good fight of faith. Why? Because the world is trying to kill that faith every single day. Right? So our striving, our challenge as believers is to continue to believe, even though everything around us says don't. Yeah? Pandemic, the virus, it's killing the faith of a lot of people. Right? Not just uh, people who come to church, but especially those people who forgot about church ever since this whole thing started. It's killing their faith. Right? They, don't believe, they don't believe as they used to, let's say. Something bad happens to you. Right? You lose a loved one, you lose your job, you Relationships are in shambles. What does it do? Kills your faith. That's everything around this world is designed to kill our faith. Why? Because it is what you need to enter the rest. That's why we're all restless. <laughs> we live lives as if you, you know why we're like chickens with our heads cut off. We, we are cut off. We keep running around in circles. Trying to chase this, chase that, trying to find rest. We can't find it. We try to find rest in our jobs. We try to find rest in material things. We try to find rest in relationships. It never works. Because that's not what true rest is. That's what the author of Hebrews is telling us. Hey, strive for this. Fight the good fight of faith. Continue to believe and trust in God to overcome your unbelief. And for what Hebrews 4 1 warns us fear if you don't have that faith. Fear not having that faith. Now, does this mean that we ought to live less always in fear of losing our faith? Okay. Because some people they probably think, oh. If everything around the world is designed to take my faith, so that I will lose my faith, do I live a life fearing that I might lose my faith? Like if I, you know, if I, if, if I commit a sin, does that mean I lost my faith? There are some people who believe that, right? Some people have accepted Christ a billion times. Every time they make a mistake, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry I accept you again. And again, and again. That's not what it means to be a Christian. Obviously in the scriptures. Right? What does it say in First John? Perfect love casts out fear. If you knew the perfect love of, the, of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, it should cast out any fear. Right? So it's not that. Right? When we say, when the author of Hebrews warns us, warns us fear not having that faith, it doesn't mean we should live lives of fear. That, you know, at the next turn, we'll lose our faith. Or tomorrow when I wake up, I won't believe. <laughs> That's not what that means. This is the last thing I'm trying to say this morning. Okay? I'm not trying to uh, discourage you or scare you into thinking you could lose your faith. Uh, but if you read the whole book of Hebrews, that's what it's all about. <laughs> it's warning us. that if you don't, if you're not diligent... You could. People do turn their backs on God. If you don't know what resting in God means. Right? Um, so what does it mean to fear now or fear not having faith? What does that mean? Uh, what, what that means is that we should always be aware 
when unbelief is starting to invade our hearts and minds. When we start to doubt, that should be a you know signal to us to hey, go back to God. Look back at the gospel. Look back at God's word. Look back at God's promises. Look back throughout your life. What has God done throughout your life? That should be a signal. That's what it means to fear not having faith. When you fear unbelief starting to crawl in, go back to God. Right? Let me put it in an illustration. Um, it's like... Um, when I moved out of my parents' home, when I first moved out of my parents' home, and we bought a house, me, me not yet, just me and her, no, no kids yet. Uh, those were the good old days. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, and yeah, new, newly married. Yeah, you remember when you were newly married? It was fun, right? I think so. We didn't have any furniture. We ate, we ate on boxes, and uh, you know, it's fun. It's like playing house. You buy groceries. All we bought were junk food, right? Because that's what you want to do when your parents are not. Uh, this is what I'm going to do when I, when I own my own house. I'm just going to have chips and ice cream in the fridge. No vegetables, no nothing. <laughs> and that's what we did. Uh, we, we were having fun. Uh, it was, and it was fun. Um, when, when I first moved out, the first night that I spent on, on our new house, it was just me and, uh, me and my wife. My dad would call me uh, at night and remind me to always make sure that the stove is off and that the doors are all locked. Right? Every night, I think for the first week, oh, patay na ba yung ana? Nakalak na ba yung ana? He would always call us. Make sure the stove is off and that the doors are all locked before I go to bed at night. Now, does this mean that after checking, I should still sit by the kitchen and make sure that the stove all of a sudden it just lights up. It burns the house down. Is that what that means? Or I should sit by the door and make sure that no one gets in. No. it's not what it means. Just check it. That's what my dad said. Check. Lock, lock, off, off. Go to sleep. Right? It doesn't mean you should keep watching. So what, what, what does that show us? Uh, it shows us that once we're done, we did what we needed to do. All there is to do is rest. <laughs> There's a verse in Mark chapter 5, or chapter 5, chapter 4, that says, after the farmer um, uh, is done throwing seeds, the farmer is done planting, what does the farmer do? He goes to sleep. Why? Because it's pointless for you to sit there and wait for this thing to bear fruit or, you know, grow. It's not up to you. It's not like watching it will make it grow. You rest, right? And same thing here uh, in this illustration. There's nothing left for me to do but get a good night's sleep and rest. Trust that if something does happen, if someone does break in or, you know, the house suddenly bursts into flames... I trust that God allowed those things to happen for a good reason. <laughs> if, if you end up dying, <laughs> it sounds morbid, but that's what, that's what it is. That's what it means to trust in God for good or for worse. Where did you hear that? Weddings, right? For better, for worse. For rich, for poor. In sickness, health. Till death do us part. What do you think that means? That life is not going to be perfect. <laughs> what you're entering into is a covenant that whatever happens, you'll be faithful to each other. Right? And that's what trusting in God means. God gave us a covenant. Right? And he sealed that covenant with the blood of his own son. And he says, no matter what happens, you're good. Just believe, right? And that's what happens. We just believe. But for a lot of people, that believing is also half-hearted. Yeah, we believe, but we also think that, you know, we still, God needs a little bit of push here because he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what I, what I want. You know, 
um, I think I should work extra because, you know, God's not going to give me those Nikes. God's not going to buy me this new car. Is that, is that resting in God? No matter why we're so busy. Because we're always looking for that thing. And, and if we don't get it, we can't just trust God for it. We have to go get it ourselves. And therefore, no rest. What does it say about um, the rich in the Psalms? The rich, I'm just going to paraphrase. The rich can't sleep. Can't get a good night's sleep. Meanwhile, the poor is fast asleep. Why? Because the, the poor does, it's not worried about losing anything. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rich is so worried about not gaining. And that's why you look at the, at the book we're studying, and this is, came out of that book, right? The book we're studying is called Crazy Busy. That's why people are crazy busy. Just, they, they can't wait for God to answer their prayers, so they do it themselves. <laughs> God's not going to give me a new house. Let me work eight jobs. <laughs> I will work Sundays. And, you know, even if it's holiday, let's work so I can get what I want. Or God will not give me this. God will not give me that. God will not do this. God will not do that. What does that show? Lack of faith. Therefore, you can't rest. And what's going to happen to you if you keep doing that? You will rest. Or you will be resting quick. <laughs> if you keep living like that, you'll be at rest really quick. <laughs> you won't wake up. Don't worry. You just eternal rest. That's why we live crazy, busy lives. That's why we're so busy. That's why we're always, we always feel like there's not enough time in the day. That's why. Meanwhile, God designed us to rest. God, it, it says in our text, right? That's why he said, in the seventh day, God rested. Stop from all your work. Refocus on who you are and what you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to be living in this world. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. Uh, and when it comes to our prayer, you don't pray and doubt. What's, what's the point? What's the point of prayer? You have to learn how to rest in God. Uh, and that means to trust Him in good and in bad, knowing that He will be faithful to His covenant. That he sealed with the blood of his own son. Uh, John Piper said this, and I'm going to quote. The normal Christian life is aware of the fearful danger of unbelief, but does not live paralyzed or terrorized by it. How does it live? It lives by faith. Fear only rises where faith starts to weaken. And it only rises long enough to get us back into the peaceful fearlessness of faith. Fear only rises where faith starts to weaken so that it can bring you back to faith. It's not so that you can continue to fear. <laughs> it's so that it can bring you back to faith. And so the good news for us today is this. God's rest is still open for us to take by faith. It is not like when the Israelites are on the verge of entering the promised land that God closed the doors. That's it. Since you said these things from, and I heard it, none of you will be able to enter. Your kids will, but none of you will be able to enter. But that's not, the good news for us today is it's not like that. God's rest is still open for us to take by faith. God is offering you that rest today. Both for those who believe and for those who are still on the fence. If your faith is weak, this is it. This is God's call. Trust in Him. Again, we are creatures designed to thrive with rest. Without rest, we will get burned out. 
and even die. And our resting and knowing how to rest depends on our faith in someone who is faithful, someone who is dependable, someone who never sleeps and does not fail. Who is that someone? God. God is that person, and through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God has proven to us that whatever he promised, no matter how great or small, he will be faithful to fulfill, even if it costs him. How faithful is God? He sent his only son to die for us. That's what we just celebrated. And the reason why he did that, and the reason why he did it the way he did, through the violence and the majesty of the cross, is so that we can fully see that he means what he says and does what he promised. So resting on him means believing in that promise, that Jesus is enough, and that through faith in Christ, the rest of his promises will inevitably come to fruition. That's what it means to rest. What does James say? Believe or ask without doubting. Right? Ask without doubting. Whatever it is that you're praying for, whatever it is that it might take God a long time to give it to you. But he will. But when he does give it to you, you better be you better believe that's the right time, it's the right point in your life that he that you get that whatever that thing is. If it's a job, if it's a, a relationship, if it's uh, material blessings, whatever it is, God will. And if he doesn't, that means it's bad for you. And let's be honest. Like, who's been praying to win the lotto here? A lot of us, right? I wish I would just win the lotto. I don't have to work. I don't have to do all this. Why do you think God hasn't given it to us yet? It's bad for you. How many lottery winners end up in divorce? How many lottery winners end up being bankrupt because they didn't know how to handle the, the money? Maybe that's why God hasn't answered our prayers. But what do we do? We strive. Snowing outside. No, I got to get the lotto today. Uh, I got to get out. I got to buy it. Or some people have it online. It's online now, right? See, so you know. Yeah, it is. I subscribe to it every week. <laughs> so I don't have to go out. Uh, but that's the same thing. <laughs> Learn how to rest in God. Because all God, if you know who God is, all he wants is to give you the best. Right? And sometimes we don't know what that is. But he does. So whatever he gives us or withholds from us, that's the best. Do you trust that? I hope so. Uh, I hope you can learn to trust that in this coming year. Uh, and so next week, when we do our prayer Sunday, let us, in full confidence in God, to trust that whatever God has in store for us this coming year of 2022 will be for our good and for His glory. Let us rest in that confidence in God's faithfulness and continue to serve with joy and zeal this coming year. If it continues to be like this, so be it. Right? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Something happens in your life, you lose a loved one, you, you lose your job. Some people, that's what's happening nowadays, right? Financial crises going on, you get sick, blah, blah, blah. Whatever happens next year, learn how to rest. <laughs> Just trust that God meant it for good and he can work it for good. Amen? Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. And give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. The Lord and his face to shine upon you. And be great. And be gracious. Gracious, gracious, gracious.